Scaling brands need influencer content, but the best brands have influencer communities, which provide a constant stream of high converting social content to test in your ads week in and week out. Access Aspire IQ's more than 6 million creators and influencers and start building your brand's influencer community today. Find out why Forrester recognized Aspire IQ as a leader in influencer marketing solutions. Hello and welcome to the D2C podcast. I'm Eric Dick, and today things are going to get a little ugly as we dive deep with Hugh Thomas, the co-founder and CEO of Ugly Drinks and a veteran of the drink space. I know we have a lot of uh, drinks people in the audience. Uh, Hugh got a full taste of the D2C newsletter fire hose over the past couple of weeks. Uh, well, we've run a deep category analysis on the D2C drink space, their Facebook ads, their emails, their websites, and Ugly has come out smelling like roses, a leader in all these categories. Uh, so we're thrilled to get Hugh onto the podcast. Uh, so Hugh, welcome to the D2C podcast. I wanted to just start by asking, how has this diagnostic series been for Ugly? I, honestly, firstly, thanks for having me on the podcast. It's nice to meet the people behind that newsletter and the, and the email. But, um, you know, firstly, there's a lot of people out there who read your newsletter who, forward, who, who sent it on to me um, asking if I'd seen it. Obviously, was already subscribed, so I'd already read it. Um, but it was a fantastic analysis and sent it on to our own team, who's also enjoyed it and looking forward to future diagnostics, which I know there's maybe some coming up as well. Yeah. Um, and we're also good friends with the, uh, the Olipop team. Um, who are also featured, and I know they found it equally useful. So it's been great to uh, great to just see some really valid inputs. We're always learning and always trying to improve. So um, you guys know what you're doing, and so I, you know there's there's there was stuff in there that we we will practically apply. So That's appreciate awesome. you guys spending the time looking at what we're doing. And marketers are thirsty too, right? So <laughs> I, I think uh, I think it's a, a win-win audience. I wanted to just start a little bit. I I love the D2C drink space just because. It's funny. I, I don't drink a lot of soda water. My partner drinks a lot of soda water and we're, you know, we, it's my least favorite thing to shop for. I've got, you know, you got to go to the grocery store. You got to, you got to pick it up. You got to, you can't even put it across the checkout properly. You have to like pick it up and say, Oh, I've got this. Can you, can you zap that? And I've just thought if I could just have, you know, this stuff delivered to my home, you know, I know exactly how much we go through on, on a regular basis. Can you talk a little bit about like why you decided to dive into beverages? Uh, I mean, be beverage in general, and then I can talk about why we do D2C beverage. But be beverage has always been a passion of mine. When I was a college student, I was the guy on campus who had vitamin water in my apartment. So I, I actually had so much, we built a couch out of it in my student house. Um, so that was my real first foray into beverages. So, you know, I'd attend parties, go to the university library and everyone's studying and give them a pick me up and hydrate the sports teams at halftime, all sorts. And I just fell in love with the variability of beverage and the opinions people have on it, food and drink in general, everyone thinks something about it, whether you know, everyone eats and drinks, whether you like it or don't like it, at least you can have an opinion. Um, and it's affordable too, right? It's certainly a can of beverage and when you hold it in your hand, says something about your life and your lifestyle and the choices you make. The brand is the hero more than anything for me with beverage, the can is so visible when you hold it and the brands in the space say so much about your lifestyle that I just fell in love with the with that space and wanted to build one of a brand of our own that uh, represented a lot of those lifestyle and values that we felt our consumers were sharing. So that's why beverage has always been exciting. And then just from a personal point of view, I, uh, having worked at beverage company before, I worked for Vitacoco in like a less of a student job, real job in the marketing team. It was like a team sport. It was like the speed, the speed that people drink beverages, the way the shelves need to be refilled you're, you're really part of something. Um, and obviously once you've experienced that, I, I wanted to recreate it again um, for a brand with our own values. So that's, um, that's kind of how I got to it. Very cool. And so, and Vita Coco is an entirely, I, I, I'm a huge fan of coconut water when that kind of took the market by storm, whatever that was five, six years ago now. Um, just, just an amazing hangover cure. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I'm just wondering, uh, you know, that's a, an entirely a retail business, right? Yeah, retail, I think now they're very much on uh, D2C and Amazon, but certainly at the time when I was working there, uh, Shopify and the world of Casper and the early D2C brands like Glossier was, you know, wasn't even on the horizon. So what I learned there was, I guess, that old school traditional playbook of beverage marketing, learning a lot from the way Vitamin Water and Red Bull and brands like Innocent Smoothies, which is a very popular brand in the UK, had built their brands. Um, and then as I've learned and developed to kind of taught, taught myself and our teams taught ourselves the new digitally native playbook, 
to complement that old school um, yeah. playbook. And then okay, the last 12 months, obviously with coronavirus, learning that new playbook has paid off massively because a lot of things in that old playbook, like handing out drinks at a music festival, um, just hasn't been possible. So it's actually, this has accelerated that new hybrid playbook between old and new. Um, and so that's been really exciting. But when you started, I understand you, you, you went directly to direct to consumer. You came from this sort of more retail environment, but when you started ugly, you decided yeah. right to direct to consumer. How did you make that decision? Yeah. And that ties back to the, the first question you asked and, and talking about shopping for beverages in general. So we obviously started the brand in the UK. We launched in what, probably 10 stores in central London in our first week. So every brand starts in one store. Ours was Selfridges, which is a big department store in London. Uh, very famous. Um, but we'd built an Instagram profile. We built a social media profile. We had, you know, thousands of followers, I think, on day one at launch. And we had people messaging us from around the country saying, where can I get this product? And realistically, a week into launching back in 2016, you know, we didn't have D2C set up for launch like a brand would today. Yeah. So I just worked back from, okay, somebody in Northern Scotland who is diabetic and looking for a healthy alternative to sugary soda wants to try the drink. How can they get hold of it? And so we set up at that point, the early Shopify. And then as we, as we scaled it, we began to realize, you know, more and more people are finding us online, buying us online. And we mapped, I think in the first six months, we mapped the orders in the UK. And it was, there's a famous map of pubs in the UK. And it's basically the whole map covered in, in, in Google Maps pins. And it was kind of like that. It was like, wow, we've sold products in Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland and South. So we just realized that, the world was shifting in that direction. And we found so many people discovering our brand, people buying far more of it than you'd ever expect, hundreds of cans at a time. Wow. Then offices started buying it. And then we added in subscription. And so when we moved to America, when we launched the business here, we knew how big the category was here. And we knew, as you said, how much of a pain it is to shop for, carrying seltzer home from a store in New York and carrying it up your, your yeah. stairs and your fifth floor walk up, which I've done, is a pain. And we wanted to solve that by having something that can arrive every month. Um, you can set the frequency, you can set how much you order. During a pandemic, if your kids are at home and, and the whole family's at home and everyone's grabbing a can, it's not gonna break the bank. It's not unhealthy for everyone. And so we've really leaned into it. And it's, uh, I think it's just added so much magic to our company ultimately. The emails that come in, they get shared with the team on Slack. This, the cons our consumers are wonderful. The stuff they write in just, makes our day on a regular basis. So we've loved it. And I imagine that happens because of, you give as good as you get in this space, right? And you guys give a lot. Your, your, your brand tone is amazing. The design of your brand is, you know, something that totally stands out on, on a store shelf or, uh, you know, in your, in your cupboard or whatever. So really kudos to you on the, on the overall uh, design. Can, can you talk a little bit about how you decide, like talk, tell me what ugly means, first of all. And, and also tell me, tell me how you decided to go with the brand as you, as you built it. No, it's a great shout. And um, ultimately, uh, you know, just touching on what you just said, the brand, is, the brand is every output from our company, right? It's every email that's sent. It's every customer service interaction. It's every tweet, every Instagram post. It's also the can. It's also the packaging on the website. So really, when we started the brand, it was coming back from that core ethos and the mission and the purpose and what we stand for before you start designing the graphics. Um, quite often, I think people get, you know, start with the canon and work out everything else. Mm. But that is not the way to build a real brand with authenticity, because even the people we hire have to fit into that brand ethos and the val shared values we have. Um, but really, ugly, ugly was the result of, you know, frustration with the carbonated soft drink industry, sugary sweetened soda. In the US, it's a, you know, almost a hundred billion dollar category. It's 100 million pre-diabetic Americans. Yeah. In the UK, 60% of people are overweight. Sugar is the number one, you know, criminal at cause here. Yeah. Um, and when you drink it in a can of soda, you're drinking 35 grams of sugar in what, a minute to two minutes yeah. without any fiber, nothing to chew, no digestion, straight into your pancreas, spikes your insulin. And we all know insulin spikes cause all sorts of diseases and weight gain and you know, the brands were sponsoring the Olympics, sponsoring the Soccer World Cup, yeah. um, sponsoring music awards. And we just felt there was something wrong in that. So we wanted to, to expose it and disrupt the status quo. Take all the bad stuff out of soda. You end up with flavored sparkling water. 
Um, and then we wanted to create a brand that just told her as it is, no promises. We're not going to make you beautiful. You're not going to stay awake all night. And then at the same time, you had uh, the former president of this country inventing the phrase fake news on alternative facts. Um, and we felt there was a big similarity between, you know, the younger generation wanting to know what the truth was in the media. Like, who, what do you believe anymore? Yeah. Um, and food and beverage um, when big brands are telling you all sorts of things about their products. And so we decided to, to tell the truth. And there was a line in George Orwell's book, 1984, which is in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary yeah. act. So um, 1984 was top of the charts for, for, the, for the winter when we were designing the brand. And we said, cool, our revolution is gonna be telling the truth. We're gonna tell the ugly truth. And that's how we came to the name ugly. And then we decided to bring it to life with this really visual, vibrant, fun brand. So we use cartoons. You won't see my ugly mug on the website. It's like a cartoon world. We, we're for everyone. We have a diverse set of characters of all genders, all backgrounds. Um, we just wanted to democratize water, sparkling water for, for a, a post-soda generation, ultimately, either young people who've never drunk soda or people who are trying to move away from it. And so that's where it all came from. And it has that rebellious attitude and authenticity of being a group of young people who wanted to create a product for ourselves ultimately i like um, it and it's and, and there really is like I, I watched a documentary one time about the history of coca-cola in south america you know speaking, oh, yeah. speaking of orwell you know and, and just how how much of a grip uh that sort of category has had on on the world for so long and, and how detrimental it is as you as you described potentially um so so that it's it's cool to have a brand that that that, that makes you, that you're saying something Right. You're yeah, sort of drawing a line in the sand a little bit and you're saying you're with us or not kind of thing. Of course. And we've added to it, too. You know, we wanted not just to take on that obvious ugly truth as a beverage, but also other ugly truths, too. So one of the one of the ones we identified as a team early on was gender inequality. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a very, very strong female leadership, at ugly, um, strong female leadership in my life. And I didn't feel like, you know, that was something that was was, you know, fair, necessarily within our industry. And so. Uh, we identified a charity partner, Girl Up, which is the United Nations Foundation charity. We donate money from every council to Girl Up to tackle the ugly truth of gender inequality. Money from that supports girls both domestically in the UK and the US, but also girls in the third world in places where it's extremely hard to be a girl, even though it's hard everywhere. Um, and then recently when we launched our plain water product, uh, we have Still and Sparkling, we decided to tackle the ugly truth of um, plastic pollution in the oceans. Um, some of the soda companies are the world's biggest plastic polluters. Um, and so we donate money from every can sold of that to Oceanic Global, which is a, a charity partner of ours who, who work in that space. And so we're trying to do more than just be a beverage company that sits here and takes profits. Our team picked these causes. Our team is passionate about them. And therefore, our community has been passionate about it as well. I love it. Yeah, a brand was something to say. I know, you know, you mentioned earlier about this idea of the of fake news or not knowing quite who to believe. And I noticed this theme on your website, even. And I wanted to use this as a springboard and to talk about your brand voice a little bit. You know, what what do the, you have on your website where you have some social proof? Like, what do the blue checks have to say? Uh, which is such an interesting like that's such a blue a, check now though ironically i think yeah, that's <laughs> right. really good one. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. But but that is that's that's such a, a cultural reference that's going to speak exactly to your audience. Yes, no, totally. And, um, you know, we've seen we've seen the brand really resonate with the younger demographic that is maybe tired of, of you know, what they've been told um, yeah. and turning around the can of a drink and realizing what's in it. And we decided to strip it back and almost, so, you know, hey, look, whoever you are, whatever you believe, whatever your background, you know, this drink is what it says it is. It's yeah. delicious flavored sparkling water. No BS, no calories. You know you like it. Like people already, there's such a huge percentage of people, I think, who really, this is their chosen way to hydrate, right? It's such an amazing market, really. No, it's amazing. And, and you, you can realistically drink six to eight cans a day of ugly, um, A, without, you know, without worrying too much and having too much guilt, but also without breaking the bank. And I think we wanted to really democratize it, both with the branding, the tone of voice, which we just referenced, but also the price point and its accessibility. Um, Health shouldn't be expensive. What is the and price so, point? Just so I understand. So, so for uh, for an eight pack of Ugly in the US, it will be between three ninety nine and four ninety nine in retailers. So you know, about fifty cents a can. We're in yeah. line with big soda brands and other big sparkling water brands. Slightly more expensive online as we have a bit more admin in you know logistics and shipping. But really, we're always working on making the price as accessible to consumers as possible. Because if you're stood at the shelf and you're 
going, should I pick sparkling water or should I pick soda? We want to make that as uh, an easy decision as possible and, and kind of really build something that everyone in this country can have access to and everyone back, back in the UK as well. Love it. Um, okay. So, you know, you, you're, so just a little bit further on your brand voice, do you, is this yeah. something you guys have outsourced? Is this something that you work as a team? Is it your voice? Is it, you know, where, where does the brand voice actually come from when the rubber yeah, road? who writes it? It's a really good question. I think firstly, like the attention to detail from our internal team on this is, is exhausting. Like we spend a lot of time making sure we get it right and really think about it. So we have spent a lot of time over time really making sure that people we work with are trained about what we stand for. People who join our business either have that tone of voice already or share our ability to learn it. And then we work with partners in the same way. We spend a lot of time training them on where we come from. They've helped us shape it, some of them. So some of our agency partners on the creative side and the web development side have helped us you know, add to it. But to answer your question, it, it's truly authentic. And it's mm -hmm. one of the reasons it's really hard to copy our brand is because this is how I would write. This is how, uh, when we founded the business, the very first emails and the very first deck we did was written. Um, because this is comes from the soul, it's authentic. Um, there isn't some sort of uh, generate and you know MBA generation course through a DTC playbook. Um, what's a consumer going to like? It's actually no. This is what we like. This is what we're passionate about, and we want to share this. And therefore, we're going to call ourselves ugly. We're going to look like this and sound like this. And if people like it, great. If they don't, then cool. Like <laughs> that's that's what we're going for. We'd rather have. 50 people love it and 50 people hate it, then 100 people feel lukewarm about it. Yeah. Um, the only way to achieve that is just being real and authentic because you, can, you can't be copied that way. I love it. Uh, one of the things, just noticing your brand, it's, it, it has such a nostalgic feel. It's such, such a simplified web experience, I find. And it has yep. this really sort of nostalgic experience uh, for it. And I think part of that is, is, your, is your, the way that you guys do limited edition variations on your flavors. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that decision and, and how it works out? Yeah, so, so just to overview it, if you, if you haven't seen it, on uh, if you sign up to our newsletter, you'll get a sneak peek early before the rest of the world on what our next month's flavor is going to be. And we asked our consumers what they wanted, and we had all sorts of crazy flavors, but some of them were things that we'd never seen in the sparkling water space. So we decided to launch them. We did a cherry cola, we did a Dr. Ugly flavor, fruit punch, we did a marshmallow. Uh, around four, we did a pumpkin spice flavored sparkling water. And we do a limited batch. You either get a text message or an email that it's available. And when it sells out, it's sold out. And if people love it, we might bring them back. Um, if they don't, then we'll get the feedback and we'll take it on the chin and we'll learn. If they think it could be improved, we'll also make those tweaks as well. So we're kind of using our community who love our brand and suggest stuff to us all the time to really help us develop the next range. Um, and then we've borrowed a little bit from kind of sneaker culture and drop culture in general. Um, to create excitement, there should be a reason to come to our website beyond just buying the classic flavors. Um, and soon, hopefully, we can add things that aren't just beverages to the same drop culture, whether it's, you know, merch or events or, you know, new innovations within, within what we're doing. Um, so that's been a really fun use of direct-to-consumer, and it brings people into our world. And so, um, you know, we're really excited. We've got so many great flavors coming later this year. Um, nice. And the nostalgic part is just clicking with people. I think everybody, you know, who has maybe given up, you know, something like cherry cola still craves the taste. Yep. Not they remember cola. when they taste that first one, you know, like. Yeah. And so when we had people, I spoke to somebody yesterday who had, who said they hadn't had cherry cola for 15 years because of the sugar and the sweeteners. And when they tried ours, it just took them straight back to the moment where they last had one, almost like transporting you back to childhood, which is what food and beverage does better than anything else. If you have your mum's cooking and or whatever it is, beverage is the same. And um, we just wanted to do it without the bad stuff. And so using D2C gave us a platform to test and learn and iterate and ultimately listen to the people who have the best ideas, which are our community. Because you couldn't um, do that in retail. You, could, you couldn't iterate no, in that way, right? couldn't That's iterate that possible. far. Um, hopefully we can begin to get some of these flavors in retail and, but we'll have to scale it and it'll take a lot longer to happen. So using our, you know, and you could go into store and ask people what they think, but the scale and, and honestly, the response surprised even me, you know, when we emailed out the survey, 
we emailed it to tens of thousands of people. We had like 67 answer rate. We had thousands of people wow. come back saying which flavors they wanted. And so we took it really seriously. And we are rolling out flavors that people want because that's what they've asked for. We're also listening if they said they didn't like it. Yeah. Um, and we're taking that forward as well. But from my point of view as a you know entrepreneur, it's just it's just amazing to see people really think, really lean into a brand that's listening to them. Mm. Um, a lot of well, a lot of beverage brands are from big companies, um, but we've set ourselves up to continue and. You know, we're gonna we we decided to double down on it. So we are we've got the next. I have the next batch here. I'll keep them secret. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. It's such a neat they're, idea. They're in because, my apartment because it's just it's soda water and and it's this flavor and it's you know it's just, it, that, that that's really all it is. And when you when you can democratize it as you're saying and get this feedback from your audience about what of these flavors they would like to see. Do you get do you get any weird suggestions? Oh, there's all sorts of weird suggestions. And trust me, some of them are from me as well. Yeah. Um, I think I briefed in pizza last month, but nice. sounds like that might be Malt vinegar. Me. I'm waiting for the malt vinegar one. Malt vinegar, yeah. But you know, good. like we, we've tried a bunch. We've tried a bunch of the ones that really stretch it. We, we really want to push the boundaries. And, um, you know, the list is long. We probably have 20 to 30 lined up, ready to go. Some of which are bonkers ideas from our consumers. Some of which are bonkers ideas from our own team. Wow. Um, and some of which are just classics that people go, ah, oh, makes so much sense. And it's like that Harry Potter, you know, not that this will be that way, but it's a Harry Potter jelly beans, right? Where it, that oh, you can exactly. buy the taste. And, and I, I never want to eat a vomit flavored jelly bean ever again, but I did. I definitely, <laughs> I, I definitely ate I don't it. Know if that, flavor, that flavor might not be in that next 30. The yeah. is ugly, but no. um, you're totally right. And like, we need to have, you know, I'm ultimately a big kid, basically. I love Willy Wonka. I love that Harry Potter, you know, certainly the food and beverage shops and all those concepts. That's what it should be like experiencing food and drink. You should feel like a kid again. We should have golden tickets in our cases. Yeah. You know? That's what's magic. And so many brands now take health so seriously. Why can't health be like that? Why can't it be like buying jelly beans or, you know, yeah. why, why does it have to be so serious and about going to the yoga studio and, yeah. Um, eating kale <laughs> like why can't you just grab a can and like make a very easy switch like there's 35 to 40 grams of sugar in a can of soda if you put that in a bowl with a spoon people wouldn't even make it one spoonful in no, it'd, be, it'd be eight to ten spoonfuls yeah um, and if you can make that choice again and again in your life by replacing this is something that was brought up on our very first podcast actually by our ceo who is a, a soda fiend uh, and he was saying yeah if you can just make that decision just to cut that out and cut this in and uh, the change it can be, it can make on your health is, is amazing. You can, you can cut 500, 600 calories a day without even noticing it. And, yeah. you know, I'm very passionate about all of that stuff. I think people, I don't think consumers are making these choices knowingly. And I think once they can make, have find access to these products and why the internet is so powerful for us, because people can find us again, anywhere in the U S right now. Um, it's just such a nice change for people. And so I'm really hoping we can make a difference to people's lives in that um, and actually make people feel healthier. You mentioned SMS and I'm always, I, I, SMS is one of those technologies that is just so uh, inordinately powerful compared to maybe traditional channels. I noticed you take either your SMS or your email. And then you also just mentioned, you know, when you have these drops, these limited edition things that gives you the perfect reason to send someone an SMS yeah. uh, because you want that, to, you want SMS to be reserved for more those, those more special transactions. I was wondering, so, yeah, how, how has your SMS program been compared to your email? How do you, how do you see a SMS? No, I got, you, you've really hit the nail on the head there and we're still learning and testing, right? I think it's still very new it's new for consumers i think it's been around a while for brands i still think you know personally i'm still getting used to having five or six brands text me a week um it's about the only people who do text me it's usually 10 percent off something no one else wants to get hold of me um but um you, you, you you're beginning to learn we're learning from other brands and i think every category is different every type of product's different you've got to have reasons to talk to people um and you've got to do it in an authentic way for ugly you know, we kind of write in a text message style. We write casually. Yep. We're not like totally text message style. It's not like long, later. smiley face, later. Um, it's not like that bad, uh, but it is casual. It's like a friend texting you saying, hey, look, this is live. Do you want it or not? You know, sort of thing. Um, and uh, we make it very easy for people to cancel if they are feeling it's invasive and everybody has to protect their mental health. And the phone is like such a big part of mental health. So we're, we're trying to be respectful understand its uses it's its best cases where we are finding really great successes when we make it special and people get 
secret secret codes, secret access, early access. There's a reason to sign up and it's fun. Yep. Uh, we try not to obliterate your phone with 10% off messages. If we're going to message you, it's going to be worthwhile. It is either a new product or a really special offer or something else that's top secret. And um, like you say, it should complement the other channels we have. Um, some days we have like a, I say a 360 strategy where it ties through all of our comms channels. So, uh, but other days it will be specifically for SMS. So we're still playing around with it. Um, you got the right idea. It's an extension of your voice more than anything. Yeah. I think, especially when your product is this flavor, is this can, it's this, you know, it's, it's literally like a fizzy water. Uh, yeah. you know, it's so important that the whole experience be part of your brand. Totally. And we've, uh, we've tested recently a few kind of, we had, uh, we held back a couple of the limited editions to do, to you know, see how they went. And then we decided to drop them surprise drops and we surprise dropped them on SMS. Um, response was amazing. We had one of our biggest ever direct to consumer sales days. And um, yeah, I like personally, I'm still, still learning, learning the best. We're still learning the best way. I'm signed up to so many brands just to get a feel. There's some people doing amazing stuff out there. Um, and there's other brands that miss the mark, but like, I don't mind it because I'm, I know everyone's learning. And I know everyone's testing things and I like to see everyone test like that. I find it really interesting. Yeah. Um, so we borrow, we borrow good ideas. Hopefully people borrow from us as well. And we're all trying to make commerce a bit more, a bit less frictionless. Um, it's, such it's, a a great, fun. it's a fun channel. It's such a great space to be in for challenger brands. Uh, I, I think the way we all band together, the way and it's a big part of what we do at the newsletter in terms of sharing value, sharing information, building these communities. Um, I want to just talk about your ads a little bit. Speaking of like challenger sure. brands, uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I really love like, you know, you, 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 you don't shy away. You really, you sort of call out the big boys in a lot of ways, right? You got your Dr. Pepper comparison in calories to your, uh, your cherry, your, your cherry soda or, or whatever. Yeah. How did, how did you, first of all, I didn't know that you could call out brands like that in ads. No, well, I mean, you know, when, when it's factually correct and the yeah. information's there, there's ways of doing it. We're, we're testing so many different types of creative at once. Um, you know, we want people to really understand the comparison of what they're what they're eating and drinking. So, so we've decided to test some of those, and hopefully, giving consumers the information, the facts, and some surprising facts on sugar content in particular, which is what yeah. we want to highlight. Because um, you can get the same caffeine and energy on our energy product as you can out of a big name energy drink brand. Yeah. Um, so we've done comparisons, and and you know, we are a, as you say, we are a challenger brand. We're David versus Goliath. Uh, we are David, in case you're wondering. Um, and Goliath's not going to like everything we do. Um, and if we're not pushing the boundaries, um, then I don't think we're trying hard enough. So, you know, we'll get our hands uh, slapped occasionally. But if we're not getting a hand slapped, then we're not prodding the beast enough. And like, I that's, love it. Uh, we want people to drink healthier, simple. Yep. That's it. And um, to make a choice, your, your brand sort of make, forces you to make a bit of a choice, right? Like in, in, in everything you do, it's like you're either with us or, or you're not as much. Market, big brands big brands had it their own way for 100 years. They dominated cash, meant you could dominate all the ad channels. The internet has democratized things. It's meant that we can speak one-to-one -one using Facebook or other ad channels to consumers, to people who've maybe never considered that there's something healthier out there. They've been told for 50 years that this is okay. Everyone in the adverts is smiling. Everyone's having a great time when they're drinking it. And, but that's why the internet's so good. And I know countless other brands, I mean, not only in beverage, but outside of beverage with food and beverage products are running these comparison ads um, for exactly that reason, because there's healthier choices out there. People just don't know about them. Um, and as a small company, we can't afford to run a, a one minute commercial on the Super Bowl. So we have to find other ways of getting there. Nice. Um, I want to just chat about your marketing team a little bit. Your CEO, how, how big is your, like, what, what does your marketing team consist of? So we're very lean. So uh, our marketing team is two people, myself and uh, Orla, who runs, uh, runs our direct to consumer and brand with me. She's worked with me from the beginning of the company. So uh, she's actually a better, ver better version. She knows everything about the company. Um, and then we, we have some amazing partners and we've been very careful about working with people who are experts in their fields, whether it's email, whether it's, you know, point of sale design, graphic design, uh, website design, we want to work with great people and work in a really, you know, smart digital way. Um, and we have found that by bringing in great third parties and really training them and really getting close and trying to keep the approval process within ugly 
very short and narrow. Like all has a lot of autonomy. I trust her hundred percent with everything. Um, we've, it means we can turn stuff around really quickly. Now we will need to scale. We need to add marketing marketeers to our team this year. But I think, you know, the days of maybe having a 20, 30 person marketing team, I don't know, you know, I, I probably stand there in two years time with 50 people in a marketing department and everyone can point fingers at me, but we're trying to be really smart, trying to bring in trusted partners who can really add value um, and then hire people internally who can, you know, spin a lot of plates and, and specialize and really help us scale. So yeah, it's you, a small you, team. You spoke to something- two, two countries as well. Yeah, that's true, UK and, and the US. You spoke about the deep integration that you have with your partners. That's something that we always strive for at, yeah. at Pilot House. And it's not, it, you just, it's not one of those like, here, package up the work and there it is. It's this ongoing sort of deep communication Absolutely. that's sort of required and, it, and we're not going to, you know, we will succeed when the brand understands that as well, because the brand has to be feeding uh, all of that stuff. All, all, all the best work, whether it's design or other work, comes from that, that synergy and that relationship between agency and client. And, you know, having been a, a brand side and, and briefed in agencies multiple times, when there's the wrong power dynamic, it never works. And so you need to be on a level and you need to collaborate. And, and the client needs to push the agency and the agency needs to push the client to places that neither might have found that they wanted to go. And it does lead to awkward moments. And it also leads to uncomfortable moments as well, which is why I started, um, we always sleep on work, right? We always will try not to feed back live in the moment, unless it's, you know, very obvious. But if we're presented new packaging or presented new creative, we'll say, we won't say love it or hate it straight away in the meeting. We'll always say we'll take a time. And it means we always come back and it's like, oh, wow, the agency really stretched us there. And there's actually five or six great things, even though maybe the whole thing didn't work. There's some great things in there that we might not have seen in that emotion. Mm -hmm. So try and strip emotion out of it and have a relationship with people push each other. And then the other thing is we bring people into our world. So Slack is a great tool for us. Some, you know, some of our partners are in the Slack channels. You know, they're part of the team. Sure. Um, and we try and be transparent with them. We try and bring them into oh, wow, you know, you, you design our emails, but you're getting an update on how, we're, how the sales performance has been in the whole company. So you feel part of it. And um, that's a delicate process. We're learning as we go and how to do that. And um, it was why you have to work with great partners. But when they feel part of the brand and when they feel part of the total, you get, we'll get much better work. Um, oh, and that's why, I, th that's why I, hope, I hopefully people can see that in the output from Ugly. Two person internal marketing team outputting what we're outputting in two countries can only be done when partners are engaged as we are. Totally. Uh, now email on any, any business with a subscription, any business with such as a powerful voice uh, as you guys have, uh, you know, I, I think people say email should represent, you know, 20% of your, of your revenue or like that's an ideal to strive for. Yeah. Uh, how are you in relation to that ideal? How are you guys, yeah. are you guys driving a fair amount with your email on the back? Yeah, yeah certainly, certainly around that number. Some months will be higher. Some months, you know, will be just under, but it, you know, it comes down to the type of type of emails, the schedule for that month, what else is going on in the world, but hugely okay. important for us. We spent a lot of time on it on the, over the last 18 months, getting the flows right. Um, making sure some of the emails are really easy when your next subscription is coming up. Is it easy to, to pause or change the flavors that are coming in? You know, we're not getting everything perfectly right because we're a lean company. We're running, you know, omni-channel internationally. So we have to be very careful we're allocating resource. We're not just the US DTC business. Um, but, we're, but we're really trying to be smart with email. And then the other part of email is people emailing us questions. We reply to every single email coming into the business, whatever it is. Um, and we reply in a human way. And there's so many magical things that have come through that. So there's our outbounding, there's the flows, there's, you know, your next subscription's coming. It's on its way. The magic's shipped, all of the fun we have there. Um, but then really thinking from the customer's point of view, you know, they got to they got to hear back from us within 12, 24 hours. They have, you know, we've got to fix the issues. We've got to really make sure they feel like when they when they get an email from us that it's two way. And I think that's been a big thing for us as well. But yeah, vitally important, playing around with creative. Um, we were always testing different things, different ideas. We did the St. Patrick's Day email today with a spin the wheel um, component in it, which was a lot of fun. I'm yet to see how that's performed, but you know, sometimes just do it because it's cool, right? Um, so yeah, we're, we're having fun and um, 
Uh, Orla, who runs that, does an amazing job of coordinating the time zones and different creators for the different markets. And um, we want, we have some really good third party providers on that as well. I wanted to ask a little bit about that because we've recently taken on a pretty large UK client. Um, <laughs> and, and one of the, one of their, you know, real, you know, they don't want to see, it was funny that they're like, we don't want to see airy North American kitchens, bright American kitchens. You know what I mean? <laughs> they want to see dingy. They want to see. It'll be raining know, outside. 200 year old <laughs> homes, you know, uh, et cetera, <laughs> on the UK. I'm, I'm wondering, do you, is that, do, you, do you put a lot of thought into marketing to the US and the UK differently? Or is it sort of with, with your brand all the same? Yeah, hundred percent. Like, I think that's one of the uh, things that we get really right is the brand consistently see globally. There's two websites, right? If you're in the US, you see one. If you're in the UK, you see another. Um, the language, even the word flavor, right? is spelled different. We have all the spellings correct. Tone of voice, certain words are not recognized in both in both countries. Trash, garbage, recycling, you know, all these words. Um, and uh, we really think it through. We have two social media channels. We reply in both markets. We send to influencers in both markets. Uh, we have slightly different flavors and can sizes and retailers in both markets. So our team has to be really plugged in. And that's why having a remote team in multiple time zones works really well for us. Um, so our D2C team sits in the UK, but works on, and, but we also have knowledge of the US um, and vice versa. We have people in the US who work on the UK and, you know, we just consistently hammer away at the, cons the consistency part. But the word I always got taught is local, um, mm. be globally local. And the best brands do that. The best food and beverage brands understand cultural nuance, but it feels the same whether you get off the plane in London or get off the plane in New York. Um, and that's what the best brands do. And I think it just takes root discipline um, and having a global mindset, which I think one of the things from my point of view is when you're in London, it feels like the center of the world. Mm. And then you're in New York and it feels like the center of the world. Then you're in LA and it feels like, you know, yep. you have to be aware of what's going on. And that's just America and the UK, right? If you're in Tokyo, totally different. If you're in, you know, Rio de Janeiro, Beijing, you totally different. And so, yes, we're in the UK and the US right now, but we always want to be thinking bigger. And as you said there, Mexico, highest percent, Con consumption per capita of soda, you know, Coca-Cola products in the world, yeah. you know, that's another market where we need to translate the brand if we ever launch there. So we, we're always conscious of it. Very cool. Um, here's a question we always like to ask towards the end, which is if uh, we were to be able to bequeath a $50,000 grant to your business right now, where would you inject that to, to see the most growth over 2020? Private, private jet. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we definitely need a jet. No, um, what would we uh, what would we do? I think um, it's a great question. I think influencer and particularly TikTok is where we right now are feeling the most excitement and where we push the most. I think we could spend fifty thousand in lots of interesting ways for the record, mm. but we've grown ten thousand followers on TikTok in the last four weeks. Wow! Without really spending any money. So I, I would really lean into that space. I think there's a lot of arbitrage there. Um, our brand seems to resonate. There aren't that many beverage brands doing much in the space. And, uh, and we're young and fresh and it feels like that. And I, so I just think it's super exciting. So it's I would lean fit. into that. Yeah, I would lean into that. Um, if there's any money left from the private jet, of course. But Of course, um, yes. That's probably like 10 minutes on a private jet. Anyways. That's about 10 minutes on a private jet. But um. Yeah, I think micro influencers, TikTok influencers, content creation is a really exciting, fueling the content creation. TikTok's been really exciting for us recently, I think. And then we layer that through everything else, but we're pretty good. We're pretty strong in the other areas. And I think that's where I'd like to, to test more things. I love um, it. Content's the way to go. I, I, I'm blanking on YouTube's new channel that they've just launched, but apparently it is just providing in, um, in incredible views. Yeah, I did read about that the other day. Um, podcast too is something that's really interesting as well, right? Um, I think we'd really love to test some of those things. Um, but as I say, TikTok just, you know, the same way we felt a pull when we did the limited editions, we're feeling a pull on TikTok right now. So I would just lean into that and nice. let the team go crazy with, with, uh, with that sort of budget. Or just get featured over and over by marketing newsletters. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get on. No, I would just obviously um, speak to Pilot House. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, <laughs> and book out the next 12 months of newsletters. Yeah. I love Whatever it. it is. Perfect. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the D2C podcast today. Uh, this it. is super interesting. If people want to try uh, Ugly, where do they go? 
Uh, so you can, if you go to uglydrinks.com, if you're in the UK or the US, um, and check out and use my code, UglyHugh, I didn't tell you that. Don't tell my marketing team I told you that. This is a nice discount. Um, you can get a, you can get an ugly delivered to your door anywhere in the UK and the US. Um, nice. Or you can find us in retailers. They're, they're listed on the website. If you want to get hold of the brand Ugly Drinks on Twitter, Instagram, you can find me. I'm Ugly Hugh. I'll try and respond to anyone that is interested in starting a drinks company because we had a lot of help starting out or launching in America or vice versa, launching in the UK. I'll always try and reply to people. Um, so hopefully this is interesting. That's I really awesome. appreciate you guys having us on. What's your favorite flavor? Oh, that's like saying, what's your, who's your favorite child? Um, but everyone has one, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't know. We've got some flavors launching next Tuesday that uh, I won't say, but if you, if you follow us, sign up to a newsletter and SMS there, quick plug at the end, nice. uh, you will find out about them first, but they are some of our limited editions coming back as unlimited editions. And I annihilated a case of uh, one of the flavors yesterday. So oh, nice. uh, that would be my current favorite, but I, I go could through- imagine a mystery pack would be a good idea at some point, especially once you get all these interesting novelty flavors, like that fun okay. experience. Yeah. Oh, wait, we've got so many exciting ideas. I don't even think we've scraped the surface of how much fun this can be over the next few years. And so if anyone does have ideas like that, I just, I will write down mystery pack in two minutes. Nice. Um, but we would, uh, yeah, we, we just want it to be fun, right? There should be a bit of mystery when it arrives or a bit of magic. So anything like that, we're all is. I love it. Well, we will be following your journey and uh, I'm sure we'll pick back up with you next year for another annual review of, of your progress. And, <laughs> when I've got 50, mar 50 marketers in the team and totally contradicted myself from this podcast, but that's yeah, great. And I'll, really looking forward to it. I'll take back that 50K too. <laughs> yes. Right. Hugh, thank you, man. Good thank to see you. you. Peace.